Welcome to The Doctrinal Component with Tom Nettles, brought to you by Founders Ministries. Founders Ministries is a reformed teaching organization committed to the recovery of the gospel and the reformation of local churches. For more teaching material by Dr. Nettles, please visit founders.org. Hello, this is Tom Nettles, and this is the next edition of The Doctrinal Component. We have been looking at some material that relates to a confession of faith that we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, we've looked at the usefulness of confessions, the value of confessions, and uh, now we're going to start looking at these verses of Scripture in themselves uh, in order to understand what is at stake in this particular confession that the Apostle Paul has set forth before Timothy. Uh, probably one that Timothy was already familiar with, but Paul was just reminding him of the obligations he had as a minister of the gospel to make sure that these things were highlighted in the way in which he taught the people there in Ephesus. Now, the text says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So this is a summary of some of the important instruction that the Apostle Paul had been giving Timothy Paul was not sure exactly when he would be able to come, and so he wrote Timothy, and he wanted him to be sure that he would tell his people how people ought to conduct themselves, how they ought to behave in the household of God. So the practical outworking of true doctrine is a holy and a righteous behavior. How we conduct ourselves among those who are Christians, that is, the household of God, how we go about uh, selecting elders and selecting deacons, how we go about relating ourselves to one another, uh, is, a, is a doctrinal matter, so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Well, this is so important uh, because the household of God, he calls, is the church of the living God. All other so-called gods are not living gods. All the idols of the nations are dead. They uh, cannot speak. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have eyes that have been carved into their heads, but they cannot see. They have hands, but they cannot hold anything or make anything. They have feet, but they cannot run. But the God that has revealed himself to us in Scripture and has given us redemption in his beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is indeed the living God. He is the one who has true existence. He is the one who is the support of all life. He is the one who is self-existent. Nothing that has life has life in and of itself, but it has derived it from God because God is Life. There is no time when he has not been alive. There is no time in, in the ages of creation or in eternity past, nor will there be in eternity future, when God has any less life than he has now or than he ever had. He is the living God, the source of all of life. He is eternal and he is perfect in all of his attributes. And all of them are infinitely excellent. Everything that is beautiful and wonderful and righteous and wise and holy and good uh, in life is a living thing in God himself. And as those who have been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and those who now constitute the church, the gathering of, of those who believe in Christ, we live before the living God. And this church, therefore, is a pillar and buttress of the truth. Why is that? It is because uh, it is to the church that the Bible has been given. It is to the apostles who were 
the preachers upon which uh, the tr truth they preached, the church was founded. And it was the redemptive work of Christ himself and the person of Christ himself uh, out of which radiated all the truth that they preached upon which the church is founded. And Christ is the one who is establishing the church by his redemptive work and by his truth. And so the, the church which believes in Christ is the pillar and buttress of truth. And so Paul ends this little introductory section. He says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Now, <clears throat> this is a great thing. It is a magnificent thing that the mystery of godliness is found in this six-article confession of faith. Well, what is the mystery of godliness? Uh, it's called a mystery because it could not be known apart from its being revealed. There's no way that human philosophy, human rationality, that human affections, uh, there's no way that the eyes of people or the what uh, eyes not seen nor ear heard nor has entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him, he has revealed them to us by his spirit. If he had not done that, it would remain a mystery. It would rem remain unknown. But it is a mystery of godliness. Now, there's an implication, of course, here that this word godliness refers to Christ himself. He is the mystery of godliness in that he was God in the flesh. All the holiness that God is, all of uh, the wonder that is worthy of worship that God is, uh, was embodied within Christ, he himself, is godliness in the flesh. But because he is godliness in the flesh, and it is God's desire and his purpose, uh, the goal that he has that he will accomplish, that his son will be the firstborn among many brethren, he will make us like him. So these truths of this confession are the foundation for our pursuit of an eventual conformity to godliness. As Paul continues to give his instructions to Timothy in the next chapter, in verse 7, uh, he tells him, <clears throat> Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. In other words, things that are false, things that are just hearsay, things that have been made up by foolish people. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way and holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So the mystery of godliness, how we begin to develop godliness, how we inculcate godliness in our life, is that which is contained in this confession of faith. Well, we'll have a few more things to say about the confession before we launch into our understanding of its specific terms. Thank you for joining me for this edition of The Doctrinal Component. I look forward to our time uh, the next time we look at this confession. <laughs>